who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, a few weeks back, I introduced to you one of our newest staff members. You uh, knew him prior to that, but we welcome back uh, to the pulpit this morning, Reverend Jimmy Basham, our pastor of visitation here at Mountain Chapel. And we are in prayer with you, Jimmy, as you prepare to deliver the scripture and the message this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. I appreciate the opportunity to come and preach. And I'm not going to mention the fact that he asked me on what is historically known as Low Sunday. <laughs> but it is a joy to be with you. I want to thank Virginia for her beautiful offertory solo. Now, we don't have as many people in the choir as we normally do, but as Tyler mentioned in his prayer, there's over 50 of our ladies who are at a women's retreat this weekend, and we know they're having a wonderful time. Many of those are members of our choir, but we're deeply grateful to the choir members that are here. And, I don't know about you, but as you look up there, does the praise arose among the thorns come to your mind? But we're grateful to them for being here and to you for being with us for this service today. Our scripture lesson is taken from Paul's first letter to the Christians in Corinth. In the 15th chapter, beginning with the 51st verse and reading through the 57th, Hear now these words of Holy Scripture. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability and this mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of this portion from His Holy Scriptures. Let us bow for prayer. And now, most gracious Heavenly Father, by the presence and power of Your Holy Spirit, enable us to hear Your Word as it is contained in the words of Scripture and within my words that we may feed upon it and grow as your people. And grant, dear Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts might be truly acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> How many of you were raised to be nice? I was. My mother taught me that one of the most important things in whatever situation or circumstance you find yourself in, be nice. Unfortunately, sometimes being nice can get you in trouble. In the June when I graduated from college and before I started seminary in the fall, I was appointed as pastor of the Lowell United Methodist Church a small mill village congregation in Roanoke, Alabama. On a thirst, on an August morning, as I was working in my study, the phone rang. When I answered it, the person on the other end asked me if I would be willing to officiate at the funeral of a man by the name of George Pinker. I reluctantly agreed. Now, my reluctance didn't come from the fact that George Pinker was not a member of our congregation, nor, therefore, that I did not know the man. No, 
my reluctance came from the fact that as of that August morning, I had never done a funeral in my life. Now, I had a year's service as a pastor during my senior year in college, but all the people that were alive when I started there were still alive when I left. <laughs> so I had never done a funeral. But I agreed to do it, and I set about preparing myself, and I worked very hard. It being my first, I wanted everything to be just so. Well, the service was being held at a country church several miles outside of Roanoke. I arrived right about the time for the service to start because, honestly, I got lost trying to find the church. Well, I got there, got out of my car, and went running up the steps into the church, and just as I opened the doors, this guy walks up. And he happens to be the third cousin of a nephew by marriage of the deceased. And he's got his pastor in tow. And he asked me, since his pastor is there, can he take part in the service? Now, this is where being nice gets you into trouble. I was nice. Even though I did not know this other minister from Adam, and even though I had worked out every detail of the order of service, I was nice. I said, sure, I'll be glad to have him take part. We shook hands with each other as we walked in the back doors of what was a surprisingly packed sanctuary. And as we walked down the center aisle to begin the service, I leaned over and I said, would you please read the 23rd Psalm? And then, to be nice, I said, and say, quote, a few words. Well, this guy had a few words. He had 45 minutes worth of a few words. 45 minutes. I couldn't believe this guy would talk so long. And as he went on and on and on, I was sitting there over the side tearing apart the few words I had actually prepared to say. But you know what was worse? Then the fact that he talked for so long, it was what he had to say. <laughs> and what he had to say was pretty much summed up in one sentence when he said, and I quote, As I look out at you now, I can tell by the amount of gray hair in front of me that it will not be long until many of you two are dead. <laughs> That's what he said. I couldn't believe it. I thought, how incredibly insensitive can you be? How utterly tactless. And he was. He was crude. He was insensitive. He was tactless. But you know what else he was? He was absolutely right. You and I are going to die. It is the common lot of our humanity. It doesn't matter if somebody is a billionaire or a bum. The one thing they all share in common is that they are going to die. Death comes for us all, said Sir Thomas More to King Henry VIII in the play A Man for All Seasons. Death comes for us all, my Lord. Death comes for us all. Even for kings he comes. Nor will he bow down nor pay them any reverence, but grab them by the breast and shake them till they are dead. Death comes for us all. Death comes for us all. And that is true. It is the common lot of our humanity that we are going to die. Have you ever been to a funeral service and whether the service itself took place in a church sanctuary or in the chapel of the funeral home, when the service was over and people were beginning to move out to their cars, have you ever had someone ask you, are you going to the cemetery? Now, we know what they mean by asking that. But you know, the answer to that question is never a definitive no. Because one day, whether soon or late, 
you and I are going to die. And the tragedy so often about death is it steps into life and it shatters all our plans, all our hopes, all our dreams. It destroys the future that we have anticipated. We are in another springtime. And in this time of the year, there are literally thousands of high school students in our state who are preparing for one of the most important times in their life, their high school graduation. And they anticipate it with great joy, as does their family. It is a most significant step in their life. But you and I both know that in the next several weeks, whether in the newspaper, on TV, on the internet, we're going to see stories about young men and young women only days away from their high school graduation who will tragically die. It may be an automobile accident, it may be a boating accident, it may be something else. But these young people who had so much ahead of them, had so much to look forward to, now death has entered and they're no more of us. And that's the way it comes to us and it enters into life and it destroys hopes and dreams and time we anticipated with loved ones. And so often it leaves behind only pain and loneliness and bitter despair. And that is truly the tragedy of death. See, the tragedy of death is not that one day you and I will die. No, the tragedy of death is the way it reaches back into life and destroys those who remain and leaves them stricken in grief and anguish and loneliness. And it is to us who face our own death or the death of a loved one, it is to us that the message of Easter comes. And the message of Easter is that death does not have the final word. That in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has proclaimed His power over everything that would seek to stand against us, even death itself. And the message that He is not here, He is risen, is the guarantee that neither sin nor evil nor death itself can defeat God. And because these things cannot defeat God, they cannot defeat us. And we know this is so because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But too often we forget this central fact of our faith. You know, my mother had many wonderful qualities. But one thing she could not do even to save her life was to tell a joke. She could not tell a joke because she could never remember the punchline. She would get it all set up, ready to go, and then it would fall flat because she couldn't remember the punchline. There was a pastor who had a problem with his congregation. It seemed that whenever he stood up to preach, so many in the pews would go to sleep. And so one day he went in ready and he stood up and he began by saying, I feel I must confess to you as your pastor that I have spent some of the best years of my life in the arms of another man's wife. Well, he had everybody shocked right away. They were, they were hanging on his every word, wanting to know what is going on. He let the tension draw out for a time and then he answered their questioning stares by saying, the woman was my mother. Well, everybody had a nice laugh. He had accomplished his purpose, purpose because they were wide awake and he went on. Well, there was another pastor who had a similar problem with a sleepy congregation. He heard about what this other minister had done and he decided he was going to do it himself. Unfortunately, he had the same problem as my mother. So he stood up and he began well. 
He said, I feel I must confess to you as your pastor that I have spent some of the best years of my life in the arms of another man's wife. Well, they were wide awake. But then he just stood there. And he paused. He frowned. Scratched his head, obviously deep in thought. And finally he mumbled, but for the life of me, I can't remember who she was. <laughs> and it was all destroyed. Because he could not remember the punchline. <laughs> that is what happens to so many people with their faith. You have sung, I am sure, the hymn, Were You There? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? And singing that hymn, I'm sure in a very real sense you were able to be there to identify with the injustice, with the suffering, with the death. In this world, it is not difficult to identify with the cross. But the question is, have you been there on that first Easter morning, standing before that empty tomb, and heard in the very depths of your soul the wonderful proclamation, He is not here, He is risen. Do we know in the depth of our being that Jesus Christ is alive? And because He is everything, is different. Have we been there? A city slicker was taking a drive in the country and his car broke down. And as he was there on the side of the road with the hood up looking down in the engine trying to figure out what was wrong, he heard a voice say, that trip to Japan last spring was wonderful. Well, he looked up and he looked all around and there was nobody. Nobody except an old horse that was standing by the fence on the side of the road. But as he looked, that horse stared back at him and said, yep, but that trip to Paris and Rome the year before was even better. Well, this man couldn't contain his excitement. As fast as he could, he ran to the nearby farmhouse and he began to pound frantically on the door. When the old farmer opened the door, the man pulled out his checkbook and said, I want to buy that horse. Whatever it costs, I want to buy that horse. Well, this farmer had probably experienced this before. So very calmly he said to the man, you know, you don't need to pay too much attention to that old horse. He hasn't been to half the places he talks about. <laughs> well, so often, you and I, we come to church on Easter, we have some of our best clothes on, we sing the hymns, we hear the story of the first Easter, the sermon that is preached. But we haven't been there. And so we do not know in the depths of our being the marvelous news. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? We do not know the marvelous truth that Jesus is alive. Because when we know that truth, it changes everything. There's a wonderful hymn with a phrase that says, Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds the future. And life, life is worth the living just because. Quite a few years ago, I watched a made-for-TV movie that was developed out of a book written by the author John Gunther. It told the story of his own family, he and his wife and their teenage son, their only child, when they learned that his teenage son had an inoperable brain tumor. 
Of course, the parents tried everything they could to prolong their son's life. But even more important, the movie showed how they sought to make every moment they had worthwhile. The very best it could be. So that when their son finally died, those parents were not defeated. But they could go on with courage and with peace and with hope. The movie was called Death Be Not Proud. And I remember as I was watching the movie and then as it ended, I, I sometimes have an overactive sense of the dramatic. But I remember sitting there in my den and watching the credits roll across the screen at the end of the movie. And as they did, I thought in my heart, death be not proud, for you have not won. And that is what I feel today. And that is what you and I can feel every day that we live because of the resurrection. In the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you and I know with a certainty nothing can shake that death nor sin nor evil nor anything else can defeat God and because it cannot defeat God, it cannot defeat us. Death, be not proud for you have not.